good morning. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Biblical Focal Points. This morning we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, and we will get to the scriptures here in a few moments. Let's open up with the prayer and a song. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your creation, Father. Thank you even for the rain that's been falling for the last three days, Father. That, that will provide a moisture base for the crops that we will have a good crop in, in the fall this year. Father, thank you for your protection and your love. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. It's in his name we pray these things. Let's open up with, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing Tune my heart to sing Thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues of Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the throne of God. He to rescue me from danger. Brought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor! Daily I'm constrained to pay. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to be. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Okay. You know, we have what we could call distorted love. On March 13th, Tad Cummins, a 50-year-old school teacher, and Elizabeth Thomas, his 15-year-old former student, disappeared from, I hope I say this right, Colloquia, Tennessee. There had been reports of a romantic relationship between them, and they apparently fled as the investigation into the affair developed. The pair's location was unknown for five weeks, but they were finally found in an isolated cabin in Northern California. Police were able to arrest Cummins without resistance. Elizabeth was safe and has been returned to her family, while Cummins faces several state and federal criminal charges. That's a, an example of distorted love. Here is selfless love. We humans find numerous ways to twist life circumstances so that our relationships become distorted into something outside 
of God's will for us. Jesus spoke of how thieves try to steal the sheep as opposed to the good shepherd who loves them and cares for them. Jesus does this even to the point of giving his life for them as opposed to using them for, self, for selfish purposes like a thief would. I have a few questions here. Think about that as we go through the message today. Okay. First question is, I got five of them. First question is, what can society do to prevent the kind of situation that developed between Ted Cummins and his student? Second question, what should the consequences be for Cummins? Third question, how can Christians be God's agents in bringing healing to people like Cummins, Elizabeth, Tom, Elizabeth Thomas, and their families? Fourth question, how can we avoid fooling ourselves into thinking that our sins are okay? Fifth question, if you have experienced others trying to use you, can you express how Christ has cared for you in spite of your experience? Think about those things as we go through the scripture this morning. <clears throat> we'll, we'll get to there in a few moments. Again, I'm Brother David, and this is Empty Cross Ministries Biblical Focal Points. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. And what we're going to do is read the entire scripture. Then I'm going to go back and we'll break it down verse by verse and look at each verse, bring it to life, and expose the meaning. And I will be reading from the King James Version. Let me make a note here. You do not have to use the King James Version. Use whatever translation or version that you can relate to and that you can understand. Most of us have experienced the embarrassment of mistaken identity. We see someone across the room whom we think we recognize. We wave, that person waves back, but with a puzzled expression. We speak to someone standing behind us, thinking that person is a friend or family member. He or she responds uncertainly, if at all. Cases of mistaken identity cause confusion. Those people are not who we think they are. Today's text is about removing confusion regarding the identity of the one who leads, protects, and provides for God's people. Many claim to be God's designate for that role, but our text says that only one such claim is genuine. Only one individual can make us God's people and give us the life that God offers. Our text from the middle of John's Gospel records part of a series of conflict episodes between Jesus and his opponents. Important for context is the account of Jesus' healing of a man born blind. We see that in John chapter 9, which occurs just before this morning's text. The healed man was confronted by religious leaders who were opposed to Jesus, but their opposition made the healed man all the more certain that Jesus had been sent by God. We see that in John chapter 9, verses 13 through 33. The infuriated leaders threw the man out, effectively claiming that they had cut him off from the fellowship with God's people. Look at the Gospel of John chapter 9, verse 34. Subsequently, Jesus identified himself to the man as the one God had sent. We see that in John chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. The story closes with further confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders. We see that in John chapter 9, verses 40 and 41. In providing the backdrop for today's text, that account addresses this question, who truly governs God's people? In other words, do the religious leaders of Jesus' day decide who belongs in God's people and who is excluded, or does that authority lie elsewhere? That The conflict. The conflict between Jesus and his opponents concerning who Jesus is and what that means for God's people was accelerating. Jesus' use of the phrase, I am the, occurs four times in today's text. We see it in John chapter 10, verses 7, 9, 11, and 14. These form part of the larger picture of Jesus' use of the phrase, 
on other occasions in this gospel. Look at John chapter 6, verses 35, 41, 48, and 51. The gospel of John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 11, verse 25. John 14, verse 6. John 15, verses 1 and 5. The phrases serve as Jesus claims regarding his unique role in God's plan to be the one who fulfills God's promise and finality. But more than that, the phrase, I am, echoes God's statement to Moses that he should tell Israel that I am was the one sending him. Look at Exodus chapter 3 verses 14 and compare that with John chapter 8 verse 58. As Jesus used this expression, he was saying something about himself that implied that he was divine. God himself in human flesh, Jesus' opponents certainly didn't miss the implication given their immediate attempts to stone him. Look at John chapter 8 verse 59. Our text focuses on shepherd imagery in regard to the I am the statements. Keeping flocks of sheep and goats was a vital part of the economy of the biblical world. Shepherds often spent day and night with their animals to keep them nourished and safe. Compare this with Luke chapter 2 verse 8. <clears throat> the Old Testament frequently draws on these practices in depicting God as shepherd, and his people as sheep. For examples of that, look at Psalm 23, verse 1, Psalm 80, verse 1, <clears throat> the major prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 11, and uh, the major prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 10. His faithful shepherding is contrasted with the harmful shepherding by others. Look at Ezekiel, chapter 34. This history, familiar to Jesus' audience, is what he draws on as he delivers this discourse. And that brings us up to our text. Would you turn with your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. Again, I'm going to read the entire text, and then we'll go back, break it down verse by verse, bring those verses to life, and expose the meaning. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, beginning in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, excuse me, okay, little situation behind me I needed to take care of. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to read the entire text and we'll go back, break it down verse by verse and Bring it to life and expose the meaning. The Gospel of John chapter 10 verses 1 through 15 beginning in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then Jesus unto them then, she, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. 
As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Our key verses would be uh, verses 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to get a drink before we go on. Jesus is the entryway. Verses 1 through 6 could be subtitled, The Imagery. Okay, let's pay attention to the imagery here. Verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. The Greek behind the translation, verily, is often transliterated as amen. For an example of that, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. A word that is often used as a solemn finality. Jesus uses here to begin a statement. The doubled verily, verily stresses the importance and reliability of what he is about to say. The image of the door into the sheepfold illustrates the difference between those who intend to harm the sheep and the one who cares for them. A sheepfold is an outdoor area bounded with a low stone wall. Sheep can be kept there overnight for safety. The door is the opening in the wall. It is guarded in such a way so that the sheep do not wander out and predators do not enter. A person or creature who enters by climbing over the wall is clearly not the sheep's protector. We keep in mind that Jesus makes his point just after his rebuke of the religious leaders in John chapter 9 verses 40 and 41. His implication is clear. Those leaders who claim to decide who belongs to God's people and who does not are the ones who come in over the wall. Verse 2. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. We should, be, we should note that Jesus' illustration is not an elaborate allegory. That is, each detail of the story is not intended to correspond with an event in reality. Jesus is probably not thinking of a particular event in his life when he speaks of the shepherd entering by the door. Rather, this detail is intended to contribute to the larger contrast between the shepherd and those who do not care for the flock as the shepherd does. Verse 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. The porter is the assistant shepherd who guards the opening to the sheepfold. He recognizes the true shepherd and gives him access. Likewise, the sheep recognize their shepherd's voice. Shepherds in the Middle East today reportedly use distinctive calls to which their sheep are conditioned to respond. Jesus seems to draw on a similar custom as he describes the sheep's response to the shepherd. Only the shepherd leads the sheep out to safe pasture. Compare this with Psalm chapter 23 verse 2. We now come to verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The depiction of the shepherd's care and the sheep's recognition continues. When daylight comes, it is time to exit the sheepfold for food and water. To get the sheep to the needed nourishment, shepherds of the biblical world do not drive their sheep from behind, but lead them, but lead them from the front, goeth before them. The sheep's recognition of the shepherd makes that possible. The word voice is used for the second time for emphasis in this regard. Compare, th compare this with John chapter 3 verse 29, John chapter 5 verses 25 and 28, and John chapter 18 verse 37. We now come to verse 5. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This third use of the word voice contrasts the leading of the true shepherd with that of pretenders or strangers. The sheep do not recognize the voice of others, so they view them as a threat. These sheep are like the man healed of blindness. In contrast with his parents, he had refused to cower before the religious leaders, but responded to Jesus instead. Bad things happen 
when wrong voices are heeded. Look at Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. We now come to verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Jesus' opponents are nearby, listening to him teach, but as he said before, they are blind to the truth, because they claim they can see. Look at John chapter 9, verses 39 through 41. They cannot believe that God has authorized anyone other than themselves to speak for him, and to lead his people. Thus they refuse to listen as Jesus paints the portrait of the shepherd. They will not admit that instead of being shepherds who cares for the sheep, they are more like thieves who fleece the flock. We now come to verses 7 through 10. These could be subtitled the identity. Look at the identity here of the one being identified. Okay, Verse 7. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Again, that double verily, that word is, is means what we mean when we say amen. So think of it as amen, amen, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Again, by use of a doubled verily, Jesus solemnly emphasizes that he is speaking a vital truth. The emphasis is underlined by the use of I am the, with its implications as noted back when we first, as I noted back when we first began this program. Okay, Jesus claimed to be the door of the sheep may be surprising until we understand that shepherds often block entrances to the sheepfolds with their bodies. They do so by lying across the opening at night so that nothing gets in or out without their consent. In light of the controversy over the man healed of blindness, Jesus is making the audacious claim that he alone decides who belongs with God's people and who does not. Contrast this with John chapter 9 verses 22 and verse 34. The religious leaders do not make that determination. No one does but Jesus. And certainly no one truly decides who belongs to God except God himself. Thus, Jesus uses the suggestive, I am, to make this statement. Taken with the earlier discourse, we understand Jesus' point. Those who listen to and believe him are the sheep who listen to the true shepherd. They belong to the true flock. They are granted entry into the sheepfold. Jesus' followers are God's true people. We now come to verse 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There can be only one chief shepherd. Anyone who pretends to be him is in the category of thieves and robbers. An example of how such false shepherds operate is found Luke is found in Luke chapter 19 verses 45 and 46, where worship acts of sacrifice are opportunities for profit. Most directly associated with the text before us is again the situation of the man healed of blindness. Note that the religious leaders would have preferred that the man not be healed rather than it have done rather than it have done been done on a Sabbath. Look at John chapter nine verses fourteen through sixteen. This contrast makes clear that the shepherd that the shepherd stands alone and that there is no legitimate alternative to hearing his voice and following him. You know, we've had in our history some spiritual charlatans. Well, who, who, the one that comes to mind is Jim Jones. He lived from 1931 to 1978. Some of you younger people will not recognize that name. Those in my age group will definitely remember what happened there. Jim Jones started his ministry career in Indianapolis, Indiana. But it was after he moved his people's temple to California in the late 1960s that he gained notoriety. His ministry focused on issues of social justice, and he de developed a large following among society's downtrodden. For a time, Jones was endorsed by many leading politicians, but following his exposure as a cult leader, he moved his congregation to Jonestown in Guyana. His little empire came crashing down in 1978 with the mass suicide and murder of over 900 people there, including Jones himself. In retrospect, Jim Jones 
was merely one spiritual charlatan in a line stretching back centuries. God had to deal with such individuals even within the ranks of his chosen people. Look at Isaiah chapter 1 verse 23, Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 9 through 11, and Hosea chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. They stand in stark contrast with Jesus, who stands ever vigilant for the well-being of his flock. The saga of Jim Jones reminds us that only Jesus is worthy of unconditional trust. We now come to verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and should go in and out and find pasture. Jesus repeats his claim to be the door, the only way to enter the flock of God's people. The one who enters Jesus' sheepfold shall be saved, that is, be kept safe from harm. And the sheep are led to and from the sheepfold. They find pasture needed to survive and thrive. The shepherd's gift to them is life, and they have it only because of the shepherd. We now come to verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. When we watch how the thief behaves toward the sheep, we see only self-interest. Thieves, by definition, do not act in the best interest of the sheep. Rather, they take advantage of the sheep. They bring death. Serving as examples are the religious leaders who seek to dissuade people from faith in Jesus. They are thieves who act out of self-interest. But the true shepherd does the opposite. He doesn't take, but gives. Jesus gives life. Others give death. He protects and provides for his flock. And not just a little. Life from Jesus is abundant, like the overflowing cup in the shepherd's psalm. at Psalm 23. Look at verse 5. Jesus gives not just what is necessary for survival, but what results in life in its divinely intended fullness. Second section of scripture could be titled, Jesus the Good Shepherd. Verses 11 through 13 could be subtitled, Giving and Caring. The first part of verse 11 reads, I am the good shepherd. Jesus now changes the metaphor slightly, making in the process a claim that's even more direct and audacious. As before, the phrase, I am the, carries the implications noted at the beginning of the lesson, at the beginning of the program. <clears throat> Particularly with the added descriptor, good. The term shepherd is used in Israel's scriptures for God, who is promised messianic king. Jesus' claim of it for himself indicates fulfillment. Look at Genesis 49, verse 24, Psalm 80, verse 1, Ezekiel 34, verse 23, and Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24. Now the second part of verse 11 reads, The good shepherd give us his life for the sheep. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Some Old Testament kings and priests were good at being shepherds of the people in a relative sense. For an example, look at Psalm 78, verses 70 through 72. But Jesus is good in an exceptional way. Not only does he lead, feed, and protect the sheep, he also willingly giveth his life for them. Certainly this description strikes Jesus' audience as astonishing. They know that a shepherd takes risk to protect the sheep, his most valuable possession. But dying for one sheep is out of the question. The sheep live for the shepherd, not the other way around. But Jesus is a shepherd like no other. Time will be needed for Jesus' meaning to be clear. Again, time will be needed for Jesus' meaning to be clear. When he is arrested, Jesus will insist that the soldiers let his followers go free as he surrenders himself willingly. We see that in John chapter 18, verses 3 through 9. His death will not be a case in which someone else takes his life. He will lay it down himself. It will be an act of sacrifice that serves as a ransom for many. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 45. We're going to look at verses 12 and 13 together. Okay, But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, 
seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. Again, Jesus depicts figures to contrast with the shepherd. These figures serve to emphasize the shepherd's one-of-a-kind nature. Certainly, we would expect a thief or robber to have no concern for the sheep. But even a hired under-shepherd, one who does not own the flock but is paid to care for it, lacks the shepherd's commitment. This hireling is just there to do a job. He has no personal interest in the sheep. As fine as other leaders of God's people may be, only Jesus is the good shepherd in an absolute sense. No one but he places the flock's well-being first. As the good shepherd, Jesus will give his very life for the sake of his people. Who cares? Who cares? A hallmark of the Great Recession began in 2007 was home foreclosures. These resulted when many people allowed themselves to be lured into taking out larger mortgages than they could afford. The unscrupulous lenders, mortgage brokers, and those like them who did the luring were said to have engaged in predatory and predatory lending practices. These practices thrived in commission-driven environments that lacked accountability. Many, many home buyers trusted their assurances that housing prices would climb forever. No one seemed to have the client's best interest at heart. A self-interest ruled. The resulting, foreclo the resulting foreclosures became a tidal wave across the stumbling economy, not just in America, but also in funds worldwide that had invested in the mortgages. Jesus contrast between himself and those merely hired to do a job still applies. But where do we fit in that illustration? We are not the good shepherd himself, of course, but neither are we to be the hireling who runs away at the first sign of danger. It's impossible for us to know and care for Jesus' flock as he does. Peter received instructions in this regard. Look at uh, John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. And he has passed them along to us. The elders which are among you, I exhort, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. That's from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. We now come to verses 14 and 15. It could be subtitled, Knows and Known. Verse 14. Verses 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. A second time, Jesus states that he is the good shepherd. Again, Underlining the claim to be and to do what only God is and does. The fact that he knows his sheep is a further implication of being able to call them by name. By name. The knowing is reciprocal. Those whom Jesus knows as his sheep know him as shepherd in return. A precise example is the blind man just healed. Jesus knows the difference between true believers and those superficially impressed with him and his miracles. Those who know him as the shepherd are his true sheep by his declaration because they acknowledge him. Verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The knowledge of the shepherd and the sheep for each other is mirrored in the knowledge of the Father for the Son. Jesus' reference to God as Father is noteworthy. In John's Gospel, this is one means by which Jesus affirms that his knowledge of God is based on something different than others' knowledge of God. Jesus knows God not by teaching, but by personal experience that no one else has. As the Son knows his Father, Jesus the Son knows God the Father. As the one who comes from heaven, Jesus knows God the Father, the one who abides in heaven. And as Jesus does and claims to be what only God can do and who he alone is, Jesus shows that he knows God because he is God. 
Jesus' authority is greater than that of any other in his own time or in any other. So, how awestruck are we with this one who is very God, the one who willingly surrenders his life for the sake of his sheep? How different is he from any other shepherd, good or bad, of our experience? How far beyond our expectation is his love for us? Today's text is both disturbing and reassuring. It is disturbing because we prefer to think that there are many ways to find God. Yet Jesus says that he is the one who is the shepherd, the door to the sheepfold. Apart from him, there is no abundant life. But that message is also reassuring. We do not need to discover our own path to God. We do not need to work a plan by which we find real life for ourselves. We need merely to listen to the true shepherd and follow him. He leads, provides, and protects. We follow, receive, and trust. That is the way of abundant life, the way for true sheep of the good shepherd. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to follow your Son, to be secure in what he provides, to honor the life he gave for us as we give freely of ourselves for others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close out, I leave you with this thought to remember. Accept no substitute shepherd. Stay tuned next week. We'll still we'll be going back to the Old Testament. We, we'll be looking at the familiar book of Jonah. You remember the minor prophet Jonah? Stay safe. Be blessed. Stay in the word and write the word upon your heart. And we're going to close out with a hymn. In Christ alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights and depths, what depths of peace. Fears are still when striving seems my comfort, my long and all. in the love of Christ, my strength. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell. This gift of love, the righteous death, is born by the ones he came to save. Till all that cross has Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for
Again, stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. Tune in next week as we will be looking at the Minor Prophet of Jonah. Enjoy your week.